Here's a crazy thing. God has a plan and purpose for your life. He absolutely 100% does. And I know some of us here, we've been journeying through our faith for many years. Some of us our whole life. Some of us, this is a brand new thing. But the one thing that we want to just share every week is if you're alive and you're breathing, God still has a plan and purpose for you. And no matter what you may be experiencing and going through, just allow the love of God to reach you, meet you where you are, and then begin to just extend his love, which is what changes our perspective on our life and everything that we go through. We have this amazing God who loves us so much that wants to be with us every step of the way. And I know that can be kind of hard to conceptualize because we can't physically see God face to face here. But his spirit his presence, his truth, his word, the people of God, when we're surrounded by the right things, it's just, it's so tangible, yeah? Like moments like this when we're singing together, like God's love is so tangible, so palpable, so real, so present. And I think God wants to continue to reveal his love in very intentional and present ways this evening. We're starting a two-week series, kind of a shorter series, but it's called Set Together. And what we're going to be talking about this week and next week is the importance of, one, being able to see God's heart for relationships, which is really putting others before ourselves. Next week, we're going to be talking about how do we forgive, how do we reconcile, how do we uh, set up healthy boundaries. But before we go into week two, we need to talk about week one, which is, again, the healthy perspective of why relationships matter and what God's heart is for relationships. Because no matter how we want to roll the dice here on earth, we are going to have relationships, whether we like it or not. Family members, friends, co-workers, classmates, our neighbors. And how we view the people around us should matter to us. How we view the things that they're going through should matter to us. The fact that those people around us may not know Jesus should matter to us. Because relationships matter in our relationship with God. Amen. We're going to break that down a little bit tonight. But before we do, I wanted to talk about two kinds of relationships that we're actually kind of seeing kind of like become a thing and really surface over the last few decades, really, but really kind of hitting this inflection point over the last few years. There's a lot of research that is being done on what kind of like the digital arena of the world and society has done to relationships. And we're going to kind of see the evolution of that over time. How does the digital world, how does online world, how does all of the things that we experience that is so disconnected from people actually affect us? We're going to see the kinds of studies reveal itself. But I think for today, there's two specific kinds of relationships that we kind of see as normal nowadays, which is absolutely not normal. The two things is shallow relationships. Everyone say shallow Shallow relationships, and the second one is transactional. Say transactional. Shallow and transactional relationships. What I mean by those two things is simply this. Shallow relationships, we can actually see through how we interact with people on social media, like Instagram. And I'm not saying Instagram is bad, but it's so interesting to me that so many of us can have followers on our uh, Instagram pages, and we can kind of kind of think in our minds, like, oh, those are all my friends, or those are people that I have interactions with and relationships with. Some of those people we might actually feel like are a lot closer than they really are because our connections with them are simply through social media. And I think it's funny, right? Like you can interact with people through DMs, whether it's their story or comments, and we can LOL an emoji and GIF it out, right? And we can have all of these conversations in the digital world. And if you might see that person in person, whether it's at the gym or at the mall or maybe even at church, you're kind of like am I supposed to say hi? Like, how do I start a conversation, let the person know that I see you, I hear you, hello? Isn't that crazy? Like, we can have all of these conversations with people on social media, but in person, we don't even know how to begin a conversation with because all of our interactions with them is on a digital platform. And our relationships are like that many times where we put that little intention and that little expectation into all of these relationships that we have through social media, through things like YouTube, just all of these platforms where we can have some form of connection and relationship. We see those as perhaps meaningful or important, but really at the end of the day, those are very, very shallow relationships. Something to think about. Secondly, transactional. It's crazy the kinds of things that you can do online without actually having to see a person face to face. Isn't that true? My wife, Chantel, loves finding really good desserts and treats through Instagram. Like this is a thing. So again, Instagram's not necessarily bad. But there was this one day in particular where she's like, I need you to pick up these cupcakes. And I was like, okay, I can pick up these cupcakes. And she's like, I'm going to DM you the name of the person. Just contact her. Let her know that you're on her way. Go to their house. They'll leave the cupcakes right in front of the door. Pick it up and bring it home. You have one job. I got one job. Get the cupcakes. Bring it home. 
And I remember talking with this person, really nice person, again, kind of a shallow relationship though, because we were having like all of these conversations on where they live, how's your day going, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, all I was supposed to do was get cupcakes and she gave me directions to her place, which was really, really deep into Eva. And Eva goes really, really, really deep, okay? But then there's these outskirts of Eva. So there's Fort Weaver Road. And then as you get deeper, it does this. And you can get lost in those parts of Eva. And I was kind of driving further into Eva. I'm like, where does this person live? And I remember she's like, take a turn here. There's a dog there, red car there, broken door there. And then you'll find where I'm at. And the cupcakes will be there. I was like, kind of getting nervous because as I'm driving through this neighborhood, people are looking at me. They're staring at me. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Had tinted windows, but I still felt very, very, very visible. And I remember getting to like the cupcakes and then she, I was like, hey, I'm here. I'm going to pick up the cupcakes. And she's like, yeah, just pick it up. Thank you for coming. And I picked up the cupcakes and they were very pretty cupcakes, by the way. Very well done. Highly recommended. But I remember looking back on that, I'm like, wow, like I had this whole interaction with this person that I don't even know if like who the person is on the other side. Got cupcakes, brought it home, ate the cupcakes. They could have been poisonous cupcakes for all I know, but I ate all of them because they were so good. And my wife ate it first though. Just, you try it, let me know if it's a good, hon. I'm just joking, we ate it at the same time, I think. But regardless, I had this whole interaction with somebody that I didn't even have to see face to face, all because of a transaction. Those are two kinds of relationships we settle with a lot nowadays. Shallow relationships, transactional relationships. And we talk about this very often. Another kind of relationship that we settle with in this day and age is we settle for broken relationships. We talk about it a lot, so we don't necessarily need to talk about it more. But the broken relationships in our family, friend groups, ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, ex-spouses, ex-this, ex-that, we've had them all. And we can kind of look at how things are, shallow, transactional, broken. And we can look at relationships and be like, man, what is even the point? Just give me Jesus. That's all I need. Nothing bad with Jesus, of course. But this thing about Jesus, which we'll look at today, is he had deep and meaningful relationships with God the Father and the very people that God had called him to have relationship with. There was this perfect tension of God and people, God and people, relationship with God, relationship with people, relationship with the Spirit, relationship with his neighbor. That's how Jesus lived. He had deep and meaningful relationships. And when we come into relationship with Jesus, who isn't shallow, who's not transactional, who is definitely not broken, when we receive him into our life, he does something in us that wakes up this desire for meaningful relationships that matter, that are life-giving, that are good. And many of us are connected into church, not perfect relationships, but life-giving ones, life-transforming ones with God the Father, as well as people here. And when we have that tension of both in our life, it gives us perspective. Everyone say perspective. It gives us perspective on how we're supposed to live when we walk out of the four walls of this building and actually be the church out there in the world. That's what transforms and changes lives. It's not just the good things that the church does inside a building, it's the even greater things the church does out there in the world, one life at a time. Relationships are the pathway for God's love to be revealed. That's why relationships are important. So no matter if you're introverted, extroverted, I don't even believe amniverts are like a real thing because I'm like highly introverted. There's no way I can be extroverted. It's not a thing for me. Wherever you fall on that spectrum, the importance of relationship is going to be important for you to walk out the calling that God has for your life. Amen? So tonight, we're going to open this series up with a passage out of Philippians that was written by the Apostle Paul. And when I think about the Apostle Paul, he was probably one of the most intimidating people of the New Testament, especially for Christians and believers, because before coming to know Jesus, before coming to know God, he was a Christian killer, Christian basher, but then he has this radical encounter with the love of God through the love of people and believers at the time, and then his whole perspective of relationships changed. And he gives us this beautiful passage out of Philippians 2, 1 to 11. It'll be the base and the foundation of what we're going to be talking about this evening, I'm going to read it. It'll be up on screen, but like we say this every week, engage with the passage as I'm reading it because God's word wants to reveal himself to us personally. Philippians 2, 1 to 11 goes like this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete 
by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God. Let's pray. God, we invite your spirit and your presence to this place. We pray for a spirit of focus. God, we know that many of us, we go through the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows and the everything in between of life. But this is your word, your holy word, your living word. And as we read through your word and break it down, I pray that there would be this desire to apply it to how we live, Lord. That it would give us a perspective of relationships that we take out there into the world. Because the world needs to know about this amazing God that came from heaven to serve and save a world that desperately needed saving. And desperately needed his love. So again, Lord, we pray that there would be a spirit of focus and that there would be this desire in all of us to let the word of God engage us, transform us, and change us. In your mighty, mighty name we pray, amen. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, God is good. Come on. Number one in your notes goes like this. The, God, uh, the gospel, excuse me, number one, the gospel reveals God's heart for relationships. Going back to verses one to four, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his joy, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each to you, to the interests of others. When we come into relationship with Jesus, it radically changes our life because we experience someone on the highest throne, someone so pure, someone so good, someone so perfect, seeing what we were going through on this earth and saying, yes, that son, that daughter, that person, that individual is worth coming to this earth to save. We share this many times, but we come to know Jesus when we come to an end of ourselves. And oftentimes, it's because of the hardships and trials that we go through. Like some of us just like valiantly walk into our relationship with Jesus and joyfully. And that's awesome. But for many of us, it comes the opposite path. Where we just realize like, man, like because of my sin, because of my brokenness, because of my anger and my greed and my manipulation and the pains that other people have done to me, man, I feel so unlovable. I feel so unseen, so unheard. And I don't care if you're like the most macho guy or you're the most quiet person. Like we all go through hardships and pain. We just go through seasons of life where we feel like we actually can't talk about it. And that's when the lies set in that nothing's ever going to change. And we could never be loved. And we could never overcome the things that we're going through that just paralyze us from moving forward in life. Like those are the things that many of us have gone through. And then the gospel says that God sent his son for us so that we would never have to leave or live, excuse me, that nightmare every single day despite our sin. Jesus still came to this world. Despite our brokenness, Jesus came. And why he came wasn't just to save us in the moment here on earth. He saved us so that we could have eternal hope and eternal life with God in heaven forever. That's why we come to know Jesus. That's why the gift that we have is so good. And when we receive that, it should humble us. Becoming a Christian and following Christ doesn't put, on, put like us on some hierarchy of being better than anyone else. Fully understanding what it means to be a Christ follower, follower brings us to a place of humility every single day that all that I have 
is not because of my popularity and notoriety and my abilities and my education and my money and my relationships, although none of those things are necessarily bad without God. All of those things, though, are secondary to the fact that this God loves me and is for me. So when we look at the world around us and we look at the people around us, there is a oneness of our mind, a oneness of our spirit, a unity with God and Jesus himself that we're supposed to exemplify in the world, even if the world out there, and when I say the world, sometimes that's our spouse, sometimes that's our father, sometimes that's our mother, sometimes that's our siblings, our friends that just don't understand why we want to follow God and we don't want to do certain things anymore because it doesn't honor him, but that might mean I don't show up for a little bit while I wrestle with this area of my life that I'm trying to overcome. We are going to be misunderstood many times as Christians and Christ followers. Before Christ, man, we all misunderstood him. But here's the balance. When we come to know Jesus, it should bring us to a place of like, man, like if I could just lead one more person into a relationship with God, if one more family member or friend or coworker and classmate could experience what I'm feeling, what I felt, what I've received from God, like that's when we figured it out. Because it's really easy, even as a Christian, to kind of slide back into transactional relationships and shallow relationships and broken relationships every single day because we're fallen. Which is why every single day we need to be humbled and ask God, Lord, let this word come alive. Make me one in mind and in spirit. Help me put others before myself. Help me see the world that you see that was worth living and dying for. Help me. Again, the world to us is our people group, which means we will be tested first and foremost by the people that we're around. That's the reality. You know, when I first came to, uh, well, not when I first came, like in high school, it wasn't too bad. At that time, being a Christian wasn't necessarily a bad thing or a strange thing. It was just something a lot of people my age kind of began to like do. And it was awesome. I got to see many friends come to know Jesus and classmates and teammates and all of that good stuff. But when I went to college at UH Manoa, completely different story. And for four years while I was there, I was a sports editor at the school paper, which meant I was constantly on campus. I was doing school, and then I was doing the paper, and I was working on campus too. So, so much of my four years at UH Manoa was integrated into the campus life of just being a student and someone that worked for the university and wanted to cover a lot of the things that the university did, like sports. And it allowed me to meet so many awesome people, like in my classes, my cohort that I met through journalism and speech, as well as Kaleo, which was a school paper. I got to meet a lot of people, had a lot of great things that we you know, could connect on and, and kind of relate to one another in, whether it was TV shows that we watch or the school that we grew up in or the places we like to, liked to eat or like the places we wanted to go to and we had a break in between classes like the beach or all of Moana or all of these things, like this was like my life. But one of the things that I was tested on constantly was the fact that I was a Christian. And a lot of it was because they experienced a lot of judgmental Christians in their life and they made it very known. I remember one time I started reading my Bible while I was at like our building and like I distinctly remember one of my coworkers saying like, he's reading his Bible. Like, is that even something he should do or can do? Like, I literally heard that happening while I was there. And like, I just didn't even know how to react or respond. Like, do I, do I address that? Like, let me read my Bible. Don't judge me. Like, there was like this eruption of like, this is what I should be able to do. Read my Bible, share my Bible with you and pray for you. You know, like there was that eruption of anger that would come up. And I remember in that moment I was reading and then God was like, just hang in there. They don't know, and it's okay. So even though I wanted to react and respond, there was a moment where like literally the living word of God stopped me in my tracks. and was like, hey, 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 I came to you when you were just like them. Be patient with them. Long story short, I've actually had many of my classmates and coworkers while I was at UH come to know Jesus, and they're part of our church and other churches to this day. It's crazy. But if you look back on like those moments where I first started feeling like the persecution of being misunderstood and how I felt like I should be entitled to react and respond, like those moments, if I wanted to act in my anger and not carry the one, oneness of heart and mind like Jesus, I could have fractured their opportunity to come to know Christ in time. 
But I say consistent, loving God, loving people, building relationship with them, getting coffee at Bale and pho at Bale and like taking all night study sessions at campus and all of those things that normal college and friends do. And just when that moment happened where they were going through this or they were going through that or they just needed someone to pray for them or someone to talk to, guess who they went to? Broken, messed up me that wanted to like kick their face, you know, <laughs> like they came to me. Not because I kicked their face, but because I was honest with my faith. Just genuine, simple, focused, centered. Jesus is the way. How would it be like if we lived that way today with the relationships and the people around us? What if we carried the oneness that this passage talks about in Philippians of heart and mind, putting others before ourselves? Our world would look differently because our lives would look differently and the relationships in our lives would look differently as well. There's this photo that my small group sent in our group chat today and I'm gonna put it up on screen. And some of you guys might be wondering, what is going on in this photo? But it's a really interesting photo to me. And let me break it down for a little bit. This is what it says in terms of like, I know you guys can read it, but I'm gonna read it again. This officer was witness praying with an uncle. I love that. He was just praying with an uncle, AKA guy at the beach. He kept shaking his head back and forth, not sure of the situation, but it seemed like whatever the officer was saying calmed him down, and that's when he knelt down to get eye level with the uncle, speaking of the police officer. I just want us to look at this picture for a little bit, because in this moment, if this guy was kind of reacting and doing his thing, maybe agitated, maybe angry, maybe kind of going off, speaking of this person that was at the beach, the police officer, based on his position, based on hierarchy, based on his job as a cop, could have came in and addressed this situation in ways that could be looked at as aggressive, looked at as intentional or malicious. Like there's all of this controversy regarding things like that. But what he decided to do in this moment was come off the high horse of his position, meet someone who was struggling face to face, and pray with him. This is a police officer doing that. And I know not every situation is possible to end this way. I get it, okay? But I like to think that if this police officer was a believer, he allowed the word of God to kind of lead him in how to react and respond to a situation like this. And he heard God say, do that. And he did it in faith and he did it. And what happened? A moment where prayer could pop up on a beach in Hawaii with perhaps two people that the world would say could not have a conversation together, especially in those moments. And what does the caption say? The person that witnessed it and posted it said, the police officer was praying for this gentleman. We don't know what people are going through. We don't know what they're experiencing. But if God tells us, be one in mind, be one in spirit, put others before yourself, because I first did that for you. Imagine what the relationships around us could experience if we live like that every single day, speaking to myself included. Amen. Photos like that, like stories like that. You know, there are stories like that happening. I know media and all of that just talks about all of the negative things going on. But there are stories and testimonies of Christ followers being the church out there. That man, It just reminds us that we're human. That we feel things. That we go through things. That at the end of the day, our brokenness shouldn't define us. But it's a very real part of what we're experiencing. All we need in that moment sometimes is someone that will just meet us, look at us in the eye, pray with us, and ask what they can do to help. That's the heart of Christ. That's why the church should look different than the world. That's why the Apostle Paul is like trying to implore the church in Philippi, be this way. Because God did that for us through his son Jesus, and the world needs to see a church that is that way. Amen? There's people all around us Literally one conversation away from the healing that they're looking for. Number two in your notes. Jesus is the example. Say example. Jesus is the example of how our relationships are meant to be. Verses 6 to 8 from Philippians. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Here's the thing. Like in this day and age, we will not have to be crucified. 
in order to profess our faith. Like that is not a thing here in America. And that's something that we shouldn't take for granted because there's people in the world that do. Jesus bore the weight of sin, shame, and guilt. He was willing to come, be one in mind and spirit, be like us here on earth, be different from us, save us, conquer sin and death for us. But he did it. And for every single one of us on this side of eternity, here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Like, if Christ did it for us, and we would never have to do the kinds of things that he would have to do for faith and hope and love to be poured out of our life, then what does that mean? What are the things that we literally need to die to in order for God's love to be revealed to us? Again, it's not death on a cross. Sometimes it's just death to our emotions, death to our proclivities, death to our biases and our opinions and our judgment and our condemnation on people, our criticalness and our sensitivity to what people are experiencing going through. Many times when God says that we need to die to ourselves and pick up the cross, it's simply how we're going to see the people in our life that deserve the love of God from us. Isn't that crazy? Like Jesus didn't die for people that he saw as adversaries, although we were. That's the thing. We were all sinful. We were the ones. We were the reason why he went on the cross. But he didn't see us as adversaries. He saw us as friends. And when we have the truth of God's word in us, how we live in the world should exemplify this desire in us to be wonderful, life-giving, meaningful friends. We actually have to watch how we enter into different places, whether it's work, whether it's our homes, whether it's our campuses, whether it's before church and you're coming in and there's even someone here that you may or may not feel super comfortable with or maybe you had an argument with. In marriage, hey, it's common. You think you're going to get into fights when you're dating? Just wait till you're like one month into marriage. It's common. It's the amazing thing about our relationship with God is he constantly works on us first before he wants us to work on anyone else. And that's okay because he loves us. And if the God up there and out there is willing to come to us and be patient enough for us to experience his love personally, how much more the people that he's called us to reach. And here's like this crazy thing about Jesus is when he came on this earth, like you realize he stayed in his same spot for pretty much forever. Like, right, he was born in Bethlehem. There is Jerusalem. There were some other like towns and cities around the area. But when Jesus came to this world, there was only one specific place and region in this world that God had called him to. Think, like, think about that. He didn't have like an airplane. They barely had ships. Jesus couldn't fly. Right? He was fully man, so he had to walk. And he didn't walk very, very far in terms of distance or location. He was present to the people that he was with where he was born for 33 years. He was born, he grew up to 30, and then he began his ministry. And what can we take away from a detail like that? God had an intention for Jesus to be fully present to the people that he was around when he was born, but he was still sent to save the world. And that's why there's this desire in all of us to want to get as many people into our lives. We want to make friends with people. We want to get to know people. We want to have a following. There's like this desire in us that we want to actually see that happen. But so often we turn that into things that just focus about us and focus about me when God's saying, like, look, I sent my son to save the world, but I only called him to a region or a city of the world while he was alive. Now, why is that significant for us? Because the people in his region had the best of him every single day. The compassionate, the patient, the loving, the present, the meaningful relationship that they could have with this guy named Jesus, like, they fully had that. They had deep relationship with Jesus. They had giving relationship with Jesus. They had whole relationship with Jesus in the time that they got to witness him on this earth. And I just want to say that for all of us, like in our lifetime, there's only so many relationships we'll be able to have. Only so many. Studies say that there's about 140 actual meaningful relationships that any given person can have throughout their lifetime. 140, that's not a lot. That's less than this many people at church tonight. And that's not to say that we turn a blind eye to the world. 
because we only can reach and connect with 140 people. But what that should mean for every single one of us is the relationships that we do have in this world, they deserve our best presence and attention. They deserve our best Christ-likeness in all that we do. They deserve our best, our family members, our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, the people that God has placed in our life while we're here and alive deserve our best for the glory of God and them coming one step closer to know Jesus. So how are we? Do we present better on social media than we present when we go home to our families? Do we lead people to understanding of Christ when we post that scripture because it was our verse of the day or are we actually living it out for the people that witness how we are nine to five? Do our children actually see that God is good through how their parents live? Do our spouses or family members that may not know Christ yet want to know him a little bit more because of how their spouse is when they come home? Like, these are the relationships that matter. And even though Jesus was only in this specific region, his love was so genuine and so real and so pure that it literally impacted the world. For generations to come, like we are the living proof that that real and genuine love of Jesus, that the disciples and the believers at the time were like, yo, this guy's for real, real. Not for fake, fake. He's for real, real. He is the son of God. That they were willing to take whatever they could, whatever steps it required, whatever regions they could go to, whatever place that they needed to be that God led them, even if they would be persecuted, maybe even beaten or killed, it was worth going to. Because they saw that this love was so important that someone down the line of this world's existence would need to know. And guess what? 2024, in February of 2024, I said that already, for all of us here, we are the living proof that even though Jesus came to save the world, but he was only with in proximity and in person with just a select group of people in a select region over a select 33 years of time. That love impacted so many, many, many people to this day, to you in the seats and me up here. Amen? So if that's the kind of love that relationships are supposed to exude and exemplify, what are we doing to live more like Christ? We can't just let our life here on earth be about digesting a message or digesting a worship moment or digesting a podcast or a service on YouTube or a good book or a good devotion or a good Spotify list of our favorite worship songs. Our blessings, our breakthrough, our miracles, our signs, our wonders, my needs being met. Those are not bad things. But if it just ends with us, then we've missed the whole point of being Christians. Because that was not the heart of Christ. He did not just come to save a select group of people in that select time in history. He came to save the world. We are part of something so magnificently powerful, so epic, that we haven't even seen it come to full fruition yet, right? It's not until we go to heaven or Jesus restores this world that we'll fully see it. But we are part of something way, way bigger than a 6 p.m. service Sunday night here at ProSide. We need to live it out. Amen. We have this uh, campus missionary. Her name is Melody Lagutan. We have a photo of her at one of her last youth services that she attended. And for the last eight years, she's been on staff at ProSled, whether with Kids Church or working with NextGen. And after this eight years finish, or even, even in between, like God placed it on her heart to go to Vietnam and to be a campus missionary or world missionary out there into the world to a nation that never even had the opportunity or even people that never had the opportunity to know who Jesus is. Like she is literally leaving everything, her family, just her normal way of life and her normal way of being to go move all the way into somewhere in the world named Vietnam. Like this is what she's doing. She left this morning at 8 a.m. And what's so significant before we bring things to a close tonight, is before she left, our team was like, what can we do to bless Melody before she leaves? Like, how can we just let her know that the time that she's poured out into so many people's lives, including our next-gen ministry, specifically with the middle schoolers and, and the, the girls that we have in our, our next-gen ministries, what can we do? And we had this bright idea, right? Like, God kind of descended. It's like, this is what you should do. And we did it. We gathered, like, a whole album worth of notes and photos of every student, every leader, every member of our church, every family member that has been impacted by her faithfulness over the last eight years, coming to know Jesus and literally taking this scripture into how she lives every single day. 
And here's the crazy thing. Like, she is the most quiet person. And she does not like speaking on stage. Okay? Like, just super, like, you know, like, that's just melody if you get snore. But there is this immense passion and love for people. And what's so amazing was this album. Like, I remember Jalen, some of you guys know Jalen Tango. She was the one that put together that. And I looked at the album for the first time. I was like, that's a lot of pages to fill. And each page has two slots. So that's basically like 200-something pages to fill of letters and photos. How are you going to do that in two weeks? And she did it. Jalen literally talked to every student that Melody ever came across, every parent, every member of our church that she had an impact on. Many of you folks wrote letters for Melody. And the 200-plus spaces were full of photos of her impact in people's lives and letters of impact that she made in these students' lives as well. And I remember, like, we presented it to her at one of our staff meetings, and, like, we gave her the album. She looked at it, and she closed it, and she just started bawling out and crying. It was wonderful to watch. I was like, yeah, that's what we wanted. Hmm. But isn't that, like, how our lives should be? Like, when we go before God one day, and he says, son, daughter, how did you live? I truly feel the best gift that we could give God is a life that is full of faces and people, men and women, uncles and aunties, brothers and sisters, old people, young people, and whatever age you think is old and young, and coworkers and classmates, and just all of the memories of lives that came to know Jesus because we lived a life that was worthy of his love, that exuded his love and gave his love everywhere that we went. That is literally what Melody did. And this is just eight years worth of her ministry and time. How do people view us? Would they be down to write a letter and send a photo and like yeah, put it in the album because they were awesome and amazing? And this isn't a condemnation kind of thing. Maybe some were like, I ain't writing a letter for that person. That's okay. You have time, okay? But how we live on earth matters. How people see our lives matters. Well, not for performance. We're not trying to prove anything. Personally, our lives are supposed to be conduits for people to understand Jesus personally. Amen. It's not about how many lives we can get to follow us. It's about how much meaning we can put into the lives that God has given us to steward and shepherd. Amen. Who are those people? Give them your best. Let God's word be the compass anytime your soul wants to go opposite. Amen. Last point in our notes tonight. Number three, God-centered relationships give hope. Everyone say hope. God-centered relationships give us hope to our world. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Like we mentioned earlier, when Jesus came, he had the world in mind, but he knew he needed to impact the relationships of the people in the world that he had contact with while he was here on earth. He did it. And we're about to go, or we're about to watch this video. And what we're going to be watching in this video is a specific moment where we see Jesus' heart. He's going to be washing the disciples' feet, okay? And here's this crazy thing. Like, Jesus is the Son of God. He is a King. He is the Messiah. He is a Savior. But he came to the world to save the world, but also to serve the world. And there's going to be this instance where Jesus receives all of the disciples. And this was one of the last moments he had with his disciples before he was going to be crucified, right before they had the Last Supper, right before all of those, those things happened, he gathered his disciples for one last moment with them after three years of investing and pouring into their life with life-giving, life-transforming, present, giving relationships. Like he was present with them. And he begins to wipe their feet, wash their feet. And this is a significant thing because at the time, if you as a person or a household had a home, one, that was a pretty big deal if you had a home. Two, it was a big deal if you could even serve food for a party at a home. But the people that would wash the feet of guests would actually be slaves or hired workers. It's just This is culture, okay? This is not just like a thought that like they had at the time. This was culture. This was an expectation that if you brought people over to celebrate a joyous dinner, your slave or your hired worker would wash their feet because their feet were dirty and your house is clean and you want clean feet in your house, Amen. But then Jesus, I was, you didn't really need to amen to that, but it's okay. But Jesus flips this moment and he gives us another insight of who he is because the king, in his last few moments with his disciples, shows that he is a king who first serves. That is the greatest part of his relationship with us. Not getting anything from them, but giving all that he has to them. 
with a servant leadership, with a servant's heart. Check this out, and then we'll bring things to a close tonight. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel round his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet then. Wash my hands and head too. <laughs> Those who have taken a bath are completely clean and do not need to wash themselves, except for their feet. All of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've just done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you should do so because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you, so that you will do just what I have done for you. I am telling you the truth. No slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. You know who else was part of his 12 disciples? You had 11 of them. Well, 10 of them were martyred for their faith. One got sent to a random island. I read about that in Revelations. But there was another person there that Jesus wiped the feet of and for. And his name was Judas. And Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus and got the Roman uh, officials to Jesus that arrested him. And that began this whole process of Jesus being crucified. But there was enough humanity in Jesus that in that moment of wiping his disciples' feet, again, he didn't have to. This is what servants and slaves do. But Jesus saw that as a moment. And maybe he could have just glanced over Judas and be like, no, not washing your feet. You're about to get me killed. What does Jesus do? He washes the feet of his enemy, or perhaps who we would see as an enemy. And that gives us a little bit of insight before we receive communion this morning. That before Jesus in our life, we were like Judas. We're sinful and broken. We've hurt people. People have hurt us. And we turn our back from God. Yet what draws us back to him isn't the fact that we're good and we're perfect, but his good and perfect love came after us. That if we were really honest with ourselves, we are very much like Judas, the bad guy in the New Testament. Yet Jesus in his love and mercy still washes our feet. 
And that becomes symbolic because he doesn't just wash our feet so that our feet could be clean. Jesus receives us as his friends and he washes our sin away so that we can be clean before his father, so that we could have eternal life and eternal hope. And if we have that heart for people, that become, becomes the beginning of God redeeming and restoring all of the bad relationships in our life or the strained ones or even just the ones that could be better. Is if we can come into those moments with a heart of Christ to give and not just receive, to go deeper and not be shallow, and to make whole what may have been broken. Amen? This is what changes the world.